Vern? No. Okay. All right. So, hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, the first, uh, my first uh, podcast video in a while. I have no idea what it is. Um, but for those of you who don't know, um, For those of you who don't know, um, I used to, uh, do these streams, weekly streams called Hello Nature Streams, which are frequently, uh, which were re which were held weekly, and I would, like, grab some news from, like, some local news, some news sources that I regularly follow, as well as some articles that people from my Discord have posted. And I would, we would talk about them, learn more about them, and, and like, educate as we go, because even though, educate each other as we go, because even though I'm an environmental science major, I don't claim myself to be an expert in a lot of environmental topics, because honestly, most environmental topics are complicated. Uh, so, um, here we go. Um, well, this is a return of those dreams. Uh, it'll be a slightly different format, um, there'll still be some nature top news here and there, environmental news here and there, but I do want to broaden the scope a bit. So, uh, so, I will call, instead of calling this Hello Nature, I'm gonna call this Hello Planet, because basically, any story, any news story that comes from you know, what we read online is basically, you know, a story from someone who lives on this planet. A story from an animal or a plant or some event that is a part of this world. So that's the that's the premise of uh, these videos. So um, if this is something, and it will include some positive news too. So if you're interested in like, Brightening up your day and trying to figure stuff out. This video is for you. And also, if you are interested in in these videos and want me to create more videos like these, just just like, comment, and subscribe to my channel so that I know that you all want this. And thank you for your support. Anyway. Uh, for this first video, we will go to, um, this topic, um, that has been submitted on our Discord. And also, I will go into more details about how to submit stories and stuff at the end of this video. Uh, so, first of all, a lab that turns hard to process plastic waste into carbon capture master. Plastic? Capturing carbon? How is that possible? Alright, anyways, we'll, we'll look into the news. Uh, so. So, uh, starts off with this. Here's another thing to do with that mountain of used plastic. Make it soda soak up excess carbon dioxide. What seems like a win-win for a pair of pressing environmental problems describes a Rice University Labs newly discovered chemical technique to turn waste plastic into an effective carbon dioxide sorbent for industry. Rice chemist James Tor and co-lead authors Rice alumnus Vala Agozub, I apologize if I mess up names in advance, graduate student Paul Savas and postdoctoral student Zai Yuan reported in the American Chemical Society journal ACS Nano that heating plastic waste in the presence of potassium acetate produced particles with nanometer scale pores that trap carbon dioxide molecules. Okay, so heating plastic waste in the presence of potassium acetate. Okay, that's the chemical reaction, got it. These particles can be used to remove carbon dioxide from fluid gas streams, they reported. Point source of CO2 emissions like power plant exhaust can be fitted with this waste plastic derived material to remove enormous amounts of carbon dioxide that would normally fill the atmosphere, Tor said. It is a great way to have one problem plastic waste address another problem carbon two emissions. That is true. It is 
a good way to kill two birds with one stone. Not to be cliche or anything. A curry process to pyrolyze plastic, known as chemical recycling, produces oils, gases, waxes, but the carbon byproduct is nearly useless, he said. However, pyrolyzing plastic in the presence of potassium acetate produces porous particles able to hold up 18% of our own rate in carbon dioxide at room temperature. Wait, okay, so this is a picture of someone feeding raw plastic into a crusher? Oh, dang. In addition, while typical, typical chemical recycling doesn't work for polymer waste with low fixed carbon content in order to generate CO2 sorbent, it could be properly raised in high and low density puff ethylene. The main constitutes in municipal waste. Those plastics work especially for capturing CO2 when treated with potassium acetate. The lab estimates the cost of carbon dioxide capture from a port source like post combustion food gas would be 21 a ton, far less expensive than the energy I mean. Base process to come and use to pull carbon dioxide for natural gas trees, which cost 80 to 160 a ton. That is a huge financial difference, very true. <sighs> a plastic jet is fodder for material development. Rice University deters uh, plastic waste plastic to material. Oh, hey, that's good. Yeah, we need to recycle more of these. Not recycle, but like, well, I mean, besides recycling, just you you know, finding another use for these after they're done, because we need to put less trash in the ocean. Like, I mean, base materials, the sorbet can be reused, heating it to about 75 degrees Celsius, 167 degrees Fahrenheit, releases trapped carbon dioxide from the pores, regenerating about 90% of the materials binding sites. Because it cycles at 75 degrees Celsius, polyvinyl chloride vessels are sufficient to replace the expensive metal vessels that are normally required. The researchers noted the sorbet is expected to have a longer lifetime than liquid that means, uh, cutting downtime due to corrosion and sludge formation. To make the materials waste plastic and turned in waste plastic turned to powder mixed with potassium acetate and heated at 600 degrees Celsius. Which is 1,112 Fahrenheit for those of us who like freedom units for 45 minutes to optimize the pores. Most of which are about 0 0.7 nanometers wide. High temperatures lead to wider pores. The process produces a wax byproduct that can be recycled to detergents and lubricants, the researcher said. Okay, so this sounds very exciting. Um. I wonder if they have the link to the actual study, but um, yeah, I, I'm. P my guess is that this isn't the first attempt at creating something out of used plastic that could absorb carbon dioxide. Cause um, there have been stories about people using plastic bottles to build houses, or uh, people incorporating plastics into asphalt. And of course, uh, the issue with always using plastic in general is the worries about uh, chemicals uh, leaking from when um, plastic gets exposed to high environmental solutions paralyzed what does it mean oh that's a good that's a good question let me let me look that up really quick yep oh, ignore the fact that I uh, looked up stream beats Pyrolysis definition. I think that's the similarity. Um, let's see. Oh, you know what? That's a research article. <laughs> oh, just look at um dictionary.com. Okay, pyrolysis, chemical change brought about by the action TV. Okay, so basically what I said. Um. Uh, so, basically what I said, w when plastic gets exposed, a whole bunch of chemicals gets released. Um, but they found that by m heating carbon, 
he- not heating carbon, heating plastic with potassium acetate. It can it can create particles in the plastic that can hold their uh, weight uh, with carbon dioxide at room temperature. So in a way, it's it's kind of like a sponge for carbon, I think. And I'm sure with every environmental solution, people are going to ask questions or concerns. I mean, it, like, it, it is true for that for every solution to an environmental problem uh, we try to make, there's always a there's likely a chance that it'll cause another problem, um, which sucks. But you know, it's it's how it's how life works, sadly. So, um, I do hope I can find the actual study for this because that looks cool. Um, yeah, this this is a really fascinating topic. But um, yeah, thank you to Kata for sharing this article on the Discord. Mm-hmm. Yep. Burning and heating stuff to change compounds. That's right. Um, next story, which is less industrial and more environmentally, um, more like my field, which is ecology conservation. And this has been shared by Alex. Also, also on Discord. So thank you, Alex. Um, yeah. To help insects, make them welcome in your garden. Here's how. And we all know that um, flowers attract insects. So this is a good topic. Also perfect because it's springtime right now. So if you are into gardening right now and you need some tips on how to make your garden better, maybe this will help. Who knows? As winter faces into spring across the U.S., gardeners are laying in supplies and making plans. Meanwhile... As the weather warms, common garden insects, such as bees, beetles, and butterflies will emerge from underground burrows or nests within or on plants. Most gardeners know how beneficial insects can be for their plots. Flies pollinate flowers, predatory bugs such as the spine shoulder bugs eat pests and insects that would otherwise tuck into garden plants. As a scientist whose research involves insects in the gardener, I know that many beneficial insect species are declining and need humans' help. If you are a gardener looking for a new challenge this year, consider revamping all or part of your yard to support beneficial insects. And then here's a YouTube video about what insects actually help your garden. I'm not going to play it in case there's a copyright. But uh, yeah, y- you can definitely see some of the bugs that help. The, the bees, the laybug, and... Um, I am not good at identifying that bur- that that bug. Oh, uh, but it says in the caption that ladybugs, lacewings, spiders, earthworms, and honeybees are among the most beneficial common garden animals. So, if you know what this bug is, I'm guessing it's a lacewing. <laughs> but if you know what this is, please let me know. Lawns are insect food deserts. Very true. It's Lawns are actually just deserts in general. Both with grass. <laughs> they don't conserve water. The only thing they're basically there for is for appearance's sake. And yeah, they don't. Yeah, they're not pretty enough to attract insects or other necessary. Um, Necessary native animals and birds and be- bugs that we need. So, some gardeners choose native plants to attract and support helpful insects. Often, however, those native plants are surrounded by vast expanses of lawn. The vast majority of insect species find basic as unappetizing as they do, yet lawns sprawl out across many public and private spaces. NASA estimated in 2005, that's a old study, that lawns covered at least 
50,000 square miles, which is 128,000 square kilometers of the U.S., about the size of the entire state of Mississippi. Oh. Uh, I'm guessing that number has probably grown uh, since that time. Yeah, that was almost 20 years ago. So I bet it's a lot more now. Even with the droughts in California and whatnot. <laughs> oh boy. A well-manicured lawn is a sure sign that humanity has imposed its will on nature. Lawns provide an accessible and familiar landscape, but they come at a cost for our six-legged neighbors. Grass grows as turf provide very few places for insects to safely tuck themselves away because homeowners and groundskeepers cut them short before they send up flowering spikes and apply fertilizers and pesticides to keep them green. Entomologists have a recommendation. Dig out some fraction of your lawn and convert it into a meadow by replacing grass with native wildflowers. Wildflowers provide pollen and nectar that feed and attract a variety of insects like ants, native bees, and butterflies. Just as you may have a favorite local restaurant, insects that live around you have a taste for the flowers that are native to their area. Oh, that, that's actually a pretty picture. And uh, why you should let nature take over your lawn? I mean, I would do it if I had my own lawn, too. This bow choice would not just benefit insects. Healthy insects support local birds and meadows, and require fewer chemical inputs and less mowing than lawns. The amount of attention lawns demand from us, even if we outsource the work to our landscaping company, is a sign of their precarity. A meadow is a wider, more resilient option. Resilient ecosystems are better able to respond and recover from dirt services. Very true. Very true. Entomologist Ryan God, Integrated Pest Management and Quality Control Specialist at Mitri Genetics in Pittsburgh, describes lawns and meadows as two opposite ends of a resiliency spectrum. As far as basic ecological functions go, a lawn does not have many. A lawn mainly extracts nutrition and water, usually receiving outside input of fertilizer and irrigation to stay alive, and returns very little to the system, he told me. Native flowers, by definition, would go well in your climate, although some areas will have more choice than others and growing seasons vary. Native plants also have provided a palette of colors and variety that lawns really lack. But planting them as a meadow with many flowers emerging throughout the growing season, you can provide a diverse assortment of local insects and mowing and fertilizing less will leave you more time to appreciate wildlife of all sizes. There are many different types of meadows, and every wildfire species has different preferences for soil type and conditions. Meadows drive in full sunlight, which is also where lawns typically do well. Not every yard could support a meadow, but there are other ways to be a better, more considerate neighbor to insects. If you have a shady yard, consider modeling your garden after natural landscapes like woodlands that are shady and support insects. This is an interesting suggestion. Uh, so if you have a shady yard, I mean, obviously, like, there's, like, limits of to planting trees in your yard, right? Like, not just, not just the physical space you need, but also, like, like, does it make sense to build a forest around your home? If you live in a suburban area, <laughs> that's what I meant to say. Like, if you actually live in a house that's surrounded by a forest, then dang, that good for you. I and that that's an option for a retirement home one day. <sighs> What's important in landscaping with insects in mind or interscaping is considering insects early and often when you visit a garden store. With a few pots or window boxes, even a balcony can be converted into a cozy insect oasis. If you're gardenless, you can still support insect top. Oh, this is this looks good for those of you who live in apartments. Try replacing white outdoor lights, which interfere with many insects' feeding and breeding patterns. White lights also lure insects into swarms, where they are vulnerable to predators. Yellow bulbs and warm-hued LEDs don't have these effects. I did not know that. Okay. 
Another easy project is using scrapboard and packing materials to create simple hotels for bees or ladybugs, making sure to carefully sanitize them between seasons. Easiest of all, provide water for insects to drink. They are bor- adorable to watch as they sip. Replace standing water at least weekly to prevent mosquitoes from developing. Very important! You don't want mosquitoes. A refuge in every yard. Many resources across the U.S. offer advice on converting your lawn or making your yard more insect-friendly. The Searcy Society for Insect Conservation publishes a guide to establishing meadows to save insects. Local university extension offices post tests on growing meadows with specific instructions and resources for the areas. Gardening stores often have experiences with carry selections of local plants. You may find established communities of enthusiasts for local plants and seeds, or your journey could be used to start of such a group. Part of the gardening is learning what plants need to be uh, healthy, and a new endeavor like endoscaping will provide fresh challenges. In my view, humans all too often see uh, uh, ourselves as separate from nature, which leads us to re- relegate biodiversity to designated parts. In fact, However, we are an important part of the natural world. I agree. And we need insects just as much as they need us. As eco- ecologist Douglas Tellamy argues in his book, Nature's Best Hope, the best way to protect biodiversity is for people to plant native plants and promote conservation in every yard. Yes. Basically, make your garden a ad for... For, um... Or conservation. Wait. I'll get back to recording. There's a subreddit called Are No Lawns for people who are talking about replacing their lo- grass lawns with more diverse flora. Oh, hey, that's that's cool. Um, Alex says, I only have a small fraction of grass in our backyard, so our chickens have grass to eat. I did find a lot of Japanese beetle larvae in the grass last month. Trees versus power lines. Oh yeah, trees versus power lines. That's also another thing too. Um, and Pete, you mentioned that you brought back a strawberry plant from school. You planted it in your backyard. It grew strawberries every year until rabbits ate it when you were in college. But now there are little strawberry plants all over the yard because they pooped it all over. Oh, wow. Hey, look at that. Rabbits promoting strawberry growth. <laughs> uh, that is cool, but uh, yeah. Let's let's check out. Let's check out this uh, Reddit really quick. I do not know. Oh, okay. Reddit's in dark mode right now, so I apologize. But okay. That's cool. <gasps> oh, Santa's very own leaf blower. This this is such a pretty picture, though. Oh gosh. Okay. Thank you, Hedgy, for sharing this Reddit. All right. But yeah. Yeah. Um. Just to, also to bring up my own experience. Uh, so back when I did my AmeriCorps project, um, uh, my my the service project I was basically work, working on was helping a nonprofit promote uh, residential gardens with native plants, um, in the LA area, particularly San Fernando Valley. And this was during the 2012 to 2018 drought. So there wasn't a lot of rain to help promote the effectiveness of these gardens. And uh, one of the things we did, obviously, was, you know, educate the residents uh, who were maintaining these gardens on how to, um, on what native plants they should plant in their gardens and where to find them and how to plant them. One of the comments uh, that one of the residents brought up with um, my team was that, uh, yes, we appreciate having these native plants, 
um, in our garden. And yes, we do want to conserve water, but also our kids play in the lawn regularly, so we need to we need we need a basically space for our kids to play outside the house. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Because the way these rain gardens are designed, they're mostly like either mulch or like rock or have like rocky uh s rock rocky uh ground uh my my, my the the non profit uh director i was working with was not a fan of rocky ground but um but um yeah it it was a uh, interesting but yeah uh, the garden yeah the native plant gardens aren't aren't basically created to have k for for kids enjoyment so it was an interesting perspective to have but um in general yes uh, it would be nice to see more native gardens in like public places especially and and for residential areas probably like on the sidewalk um i am blanking on the term right now for the grass on the sidewalk uh, <laughs> but yeah more yeah m more native gardens would be good and that is and uh alex said that drought helped promote the restoration of the la river and the recreations under the san fernando valley oh yeah yeah that's true i wonder how the la river restoration is going by the way i haven't um, checked in on that in a while. Anyways, that is the end of that story. And I guess I have one more story I want to share. Uh, this time, it's not, this is not a nature-related news, but, um, this is one of those positive news I was hoping to talk about. Uh, so I am on this website called goodnewsnetwork.org. Um, where they collect like uh positive news, I I believe they're nonprofit, right? Are they nonprofit? Uh, they seem to be a nonprofit, I think. Is there a .org, right? <laughs> I don't know. Get involved, become a member. Oh, okay. Looks like they uh, make uh, money mostly by membership. Oh, never mind. They're not nonprofit. I take it back. <laughs> they have a .org domain, but they're not nonprofit. Good news sells. Okay. Okay, good news. So, okay, okay, okay. So very poor profit, but they sell a uh, positive news. All right. Forget what I said <laughs> about them being a nonprofit. Uh, oh wait, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, anyways, this story. And I picked this because it features a doggo, a cute Yorkshire Terrier, and it's about tiny Yorkshire, and it's about. Um, a tiny York, a dog helping their owner realize something's wrong. And you just gotta love stories like that. Tiny Yorkshire Terrier detects breast cancer in women jumping up and down in her chest in alarm. A Yorkshire Terrier saved her owner's life after jumping up and down on the chest to alert her to a cancer slump. 11-year-old Pooch Bella Boo, aww. Uh, what a cute name. Wouldn't settle in a usual sleeping place. I kept trying to lie on Karina Kirk Jane's chest tight despite being pushed away. The dog's odd demeanor continued over the next few weeks as he even started to cry. Oh, oh, the dog started to cry. Oh, that's how you know you really have a good dog. Such a loyal dog. When she were to stop weeping, it left Karina concerned about her health. Baffled vets confirmed that she was fit and healthy. 
Karina caught it a heartbreaking cry, and Dot the dog was obviously trying to tell me something. She continued looking and hopping on the 53-year-old's chest. Bella started bouncing on me, and at one point I actually thought she brushed to bruise me as I was very sore there. And I was feeling around, and I actually felt a lump, and I was thinking, Is that a lump inside? Then doctors confirmed it was breast cancer. The Blackburn Lancashire woman then underwent life-saving treatment and believes the disease would have been missed if it wasn't for Bella Boo's actions. I didn't think dogs could detect cancer. I thought it was a lot of hoo-ha, really, but this proves that they can. I'm just so lucky to be here. Little, little Bella Boo saved my life. Bella always slept on the back of my legs, but she kept lying on my chest. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Happy owner. Cute dog. So cool. Every time I took her all off me, she crawled back on again. The doctor said the cancer had spread to her lymph nodes, and Karina thinks that's why Bella was getting more determined, because it was spreading. After the whole ordeal, the woman traveled around the world to having realized how lucky she was to get her diagnosis early enough. I didn't believe it that time of thing. I didn't believe dogs could detect cancer. Once I got the cancer removed, she stopped right away and she started lying behind my legs again. Karina now urges pet owners to pay attention to their strange behavior in the future. Maybe if people see the dogs start acting straight, they'll be able to think twice. People underestimate dogs and cats and all animals, but they are amazing creatures. Yeah, it is amazing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Like, this this is just one of the many reasons why I want to have my own emotional support dog or cat in the future. But, yeah, that that is so cool that she, she has a dog who cares for her. And she, w and she was able to travel right after she was able to get a diagnosis and uh, survive. I mean, I'm not sure. I don't think the article says she's, uh, the article didn't say she was, uh, still finishing, uh, whether she was still going through her treatment or not. Oh, okay, she did say she got the cancer removed. Okay. Wow. That is really cool. Now, for those of you who may be suspicious about, like, this website, is this fake news? I, I, you know, normally I would try to look up the validity of this website. Or, like, try to see if there was another story, another uh, website that also posted this story. But, honestly, I, I just needed, like, a pick-me-upper. Because I I have been depressed for a very long time, and I realize the more I hang out with like people with depressing stories, so the more I read depressing stories in general, the more it, like reinforces that depression. So just try to read stuff like this really helps. And um, at some point, I that's what I want to do with um. Yeah, I want to read more positive news more often, so th that's what I am plan to do and what I hope to do with this video series. So, uh, so um, everyone, uh, that's the end of Hello Planet. Uh, I hope, uh, I know the format is still messy, but, um... But I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you all enjoyed this video. The news stories. Uh, maybe we'll have some positive news next time. I don't know how often this will be. The goal is weekly. But um, there's no guarantee. So um, if you like it. Like this video. Feel free to comment. Li like, comment, uh, subscribe. Especially um, since these videos are meant to be educational. And, um, and, yeah, sometimes we don't always get 
details right so feel free to correct uh, correct stuff in the comments below and if you want to submit stories um there'll be a link to join the planet discord in the youtube description and also um you can also support me through coffee uh which will also be in the youtube description so everyone thank you so much and uh yeah stay tuned for um more hello nature no hello planet i'm sorry bye bye youtube